Manipulation and premeditation. Two weeks ago, I stood here and told you that this case was about those two things. And now that you've heard the evidence, I'm sure you would agree. I also told you that at its core, it was a simple case. And I think that has been proven beyond a reasonable doubt. Donna Matthews caused the death of Michael Gann, and she did so intentionally. And she didn't do it thinking the force she needed, the force that she used was needed to prevent imminent danger or death or great bodily harm, and no reasonable person would have thought that. This was, to be sure, a complex relationship, but your verdict is not about the drama in their relationship in 2014 or 2015 or even in the early months of 2016. This case is about what happened on July 4th, 2016. And the planning for what happened on July 4th of 2016 began two to three months earlier because that's when she started making her plans to kill him. Derek Matthews testified that his sister began talking and planning in late April, early May. They explored various ideas to kill Michael. How can the threat be imminent, which means near at hand or on the point of happening, when you start your plans to kill someone months in advance? She offered Derek money to help her do this or to do it for her. And when he hesitated, she tried to find someone else to embroil in her criminal plan. She messaged various friends in May of 2016, almost two months before, saying she wished he would die or that someone would kill him. She has admitted herself she tried to involve 60 people in this plan to kill Michael. This is not a sign of self-defense. This is a sign of a motivated and focused woman who wanted to get rid of this man in her life because he was bothersome. There was an internet search for a used gun at gandermountain.com on Ms. Matthews' phone as early as June 9, 2016. That's a month, almost a month before she killed him while she's in Hawaii and he is 4,000 miles away in Kenosha, Wisconsin. 21 days before killing Michael, she calls her friend Christina Schrader and asks her for a gun, um, tells her that she's coming back to Kenosha from Hawaii on July 3rd or July 4th to kill Michael. She says she's willing to pay someone $5,000 to kill him, and she asks Christina to help her find someone to kill him. Again, not a sign of self-defense when you make these types of plans. She called her ex-boyfriend, Perry Rankin, and asked his help to dispose of Michael because Perry is bigger and stronger. And she told him, I'm going to kill Michael. This was all in June of 2016. She called Ryan Waite. She asked him for a gun. She did not care who she was implicating or how she was implicating them. She was focused on her selfish motive of protecting her reputation. June 19th of 2016, she messages Michael Gann. We spent quite a bit of time going through these messages. It was a packet of maybe 44 pages or 14 pages. It was many pages of uh, communication between the two of them where she tries to lure Michael to Hawaii to set him up so she can kill him. Her plan was to lure him to a remote area to push him off a cliff. And she tried so hard in those messages to get him there. She used her best manipulation tricks. Sex, the promise of oral sex. She sends a naked picture of herself. She sends a video of herself masturbating. All the things that she knew would make Michael feel loved and wanted and desired, which is what Michael always wanted. She says, we can go straight to the waterfalls and make love. I'll bring a picnic and cocktails and we'll camp out for two days. Eating, drinking, and you fucking me for 48 hours, no interruption. And despite these being the things that he desperately wanted from her, he didn't come. The tickets were expensive. He thought it was a little too much from her after all the nastiness. And she had already told him she was coming back in July. But he did say, I love you, Donna, in the course of those messages. And remember his last message to her in that exchange. 
thank you for the quality time together last night. I hope you don't have any regrets. That's not the sign of a man who's planning to kill another woman. What if he had flown to Hawaii? Think about that. He could have and would have been completely unsuspecting and blissfully ignorant of her plans. And there too, she would have and could have killed him. And again, there would have been no danger of any imminent death or great bodily harm to her or anyone else in her family if he had flown to Hawaii and she had killed him the way she wanted to. Except to him. Derek told you that she had discussed this plan with him and she wanted to throw him to the sharks. And what he said, which was her quote, which I thought was pretty telling, was she just wanted the drama to end. Not self-defense, not imminent danger. This was all about Facebook. In fact, if you think about what Donna Matthews has said when she testified, she can't even keep her own lies straight. First, she says that it was the threat to Sydney that was the turning point, and that's why she had to come back to Kenosha. Um, that's when she knew she had to kill him. But then when I told her, when I confronted her with the fact, well, this plan to lure Michael to um, Hawaii happened before the threat to Sydney, right? Isn't that what you just said? Well, then she changes the story. Oh, no, the threat to Sydney happened some other time. Um, you know, some amorphous, vague, non-concrete time. And what's important, really important, is that her plans to kill him coincided with him posting pictures of her on Facebook, pictures that exposed her lies to all her friends. And that was his intent. He knew she had said all these horrible things about him, called him a stalker, called him a horrible person, said she was running from him. And he was sick of it, and he wanted to expose her lies. This is how he dealt with it, not by trying to kill her, but by exposing her to her friends, which he knew, knowing her as well as, she, as he did, was the most important thing to her. This Facebook list of 700 friends. And so on June 11th, he purchased a ticket for her to fly back, July 5th. By this time, her plan was surely in motion. She wouldn't have agreed to come back if she didn't already have this plan. And on July 4th, she sent messages pretending she was still in Maui and working. But instead, she was flying back from Maui and arrived in Kenosha on July 4th. And we showed you this picture. States Exhibit 15. Here's Ms. Matthews at the airport. Does she look afraid? Does she look like she's anticipating this horrible moment um, when she has to reach Michael before he can get to her, her daughter or her friends or her or her family or the family dog? She looks pretty smug and self-satisfied, pretty excited for her plans. Apparently, Michael's ability to find Donna Matthews anywhere, which is one of the many lies she testified to, did not extend to the airport in Maui, the airport in Seattle, the airport in Chicago, the Brat stop where she um, arrived in Kenosha, the motel where she went to take a nap, or even when she was standing outside his house. Because the truth is, he only ever knew where she was because she told him. And she gave him the clues to find her. Derek told you that he tried to talk her out of it when she arrived, but she could not be convinced. She was consumed with protecting her image and her reputation. And one of the most telling statements, in my opinion, was when Derek testified that his sister said, irately, I wouldn't have flown back if you weren't going to help me. Now think about that. If he wasn't going to help her, she wouldn't have come back. Isn't that 
absolute proof in her own words that there was no imminent threat of death or great bodily harm, and she knew there wasn't. If you're protecting your daughter and yourself, does it matter if your brother's going to help you or are you going to find a way? She told him that there was a deadline for killing Michael, and that deadline was July 5th. She had to kill him before he could post any more embarrassing, horrific pictures because she knew when or if she finally admitted that she wasn't going to get back with him, he was going to resume the posting of Facebook pictures. And she believed that he would send these to her friends in Hawaii and this would ruin her reputation. Was it a nice thing for Michael Gahan to do or to threaten to do? No. Does it give you self-defense and the legal authority to kill someone else? No, it doesn't. This had nothing to do with protecting her life or that of her daughter. It had everything to do with protecting the fiction that Ms. Matthews created for her friends and family. You heard them testify. Her own brothers who believed her drama and her tears only on the witness stand for the first time realized she had deceived them. Dayton had no idea that Donna Matthews had come, when she had come to his house, that she had come to his house after living and traveling with Michael. You know, the big dramatic escape from Arizona. Nor did he know apparently that when she left his house, after this big dramatic escape from Arizona, that she made plans to meet Michael in Chicago in January for four days of sex and drugs and alcohol and dinner time together. David Matthews, with whom she lived for a while, also didn't know that when she left his house and began traveling in Colorado and Arizona, that she did so with Michael. During a time in the testimony that she described as a good time with Michael, this time when they were traveling in Colorado and Arizona. But of course, she only admits that on cross-examination, where I showed her these messages dated November 1st, where she says, love you too, good night, Michael, kisses, you're so romantic, I love romance, and I like it question mark, or excuse me, heart sign. Only when confronted with that does she come up with this explanation like, well, uh, that was a good time in our relationship. She doesn't share that information with her family, did she? She says in these messages, Michael, you'll always be a better person than me. And that is true. She fooled her brother Derek in many of the same ways that she fooled Dayton and David and everyone else. He had no idea that she had lied to him about so many things. And because of that, and because of her drama that she had built up over time, he gives her his gun. A 38 revolver fully loaded. And dark clothing to wear so she would not be seen in the dark. He drives her to Michael's house. He drops her off before the fireworks while it's still a little light out. Now, when you believe you're in, in imminent danger of death or great bodily harm, do you plot your defense, your self-defense, to coincide with the fireworks? Do you take a nap first? Do you stalk your victim outside his home for an hour before going in to defend yourself? She testified she didn't even know where her daughters were. She didn't know where her brothers were, despite claiming that she was doing all of this for them. In fact, she flew her daughter in a week earlier from the safety of Turkey. Think about whether that makes any sense. She waited across the street. She clearly was not afraid of what would happen if he saw her there. I asked her, where did you hide? Where were you hiding, Ms. Matthews? Well, I didn't hide. I just stood across the street. Because she wasn't afraid of him hurting her. What she was afraid of was someone else seeing her 
and identifying her as the murderer. So she dressed all in black, black clothes, black hat, and she waited for the fireworks. Now notice that picture we have of her after the murder, the black shirt is gone, the black cap is gone. She did that so if anyone saw her go in, they would never make the connection to her later on. She sent him text messages. Oh, go to 316. Please take these pictures for me. I want to see this room. I want to see that room. And even though it was late, because he loved her, he walked over to that other house. And at 10.13 p.m. and 10.14 p.m., he took the pictures for her, pictures that he never got the chance to send. And remember what she said on cross when I pressured her on this point. How did you know he was going to do it? How did you know that he was going to take these pictures for you? You knew because Michael loved you, not because he hated you and wanted you dead. And she said she knew. She knew that he would do it because he loved her. And then she snuck into his house. And she hid behind the closet in a spot she knew he would not be able to see when he re-entered. And she waited to kill him. And when he came back in, she didn't shoot him right away, like she claims. She waited even longer until he sat down, put down his keys, put down his phone. And then when he was in the most vulnerable position, seated, not standing, and absolutely could not defend himself, having no idea she was there, thinking she was 4,000 miles away because of the lies that she had told him, she came out of her hiding spot and she unloaded the gun. Five bullets, three of them hit him. There had been no confrontation, no argument, no words exchanged, no fight, no one else there for Donna Matthews to defend or protect, just Michael alone with her rage. There was no imminent danger on that day or at that moment, only to Michael Gann, not to Donna Matthews. And she yelled, motherfucker. And forgive me for the language that I have used throughout this trial, but I'm just repeating the words that Ms. Matthews has used. Just another piece of evidence of her rage and her motivation. And after shooting him and seeing him make it to the door where he collapsed, she heard him still make noise indicating he was still alive. And so she hit him in the head with the gun. One final blow to finish things off to guarantee he never got up again. Now you heard her. She disagrees with criminalist Todd Thorne about how this happened. He is the expert, he has the training, but Donna Matthews disagrees. You know why? Because she cannot admit, and she will not admit to you and her friends and her family, that not only was Michael completely unsuspecting and in a vulnerable position when she started shooting him, when he realized she was there, he ran away from her. He did nothing to stop her. He did not advance on her despite being bigger. He didn't try to get the gun away from her. He tried to get away. And she shot him as he was running away. She shot him in the back. And you know what? This too hurts her fictional image that she's built up over these past several years with her friends and family. Who shoots a man in the back as he's running away from you? That's not self-defense. There was a shot in his back. She says, no, 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 there was no shot. Well, you saw enough pictures, diagrams, video reenactment of where the shots were. This is the shot that caused him to die. This is the one that perforated the organs that caused him to die. The one while he's running away from her. The pictures don't lie. 
Ms. Matthews may lie, but the pictures don't lie. There's the blood on the chair, the shoring from the bullets as they pass through his body and lost velocity and struck the leather as they exit the body. The blood in the direction towards the door. None of that could have gotten where it did if you believed her story. It's yet another lie by Donna Matthews. Because the truth is, this was cold-blooded murder in the worst way. And then she took his phone, ensuring he would not be able to call for help if by some miracle he was able to get up again. Now, she testified she took it because it had embarrassing photos of it on her. Once again, evidence of her true motive. I need to get those embarrassing photos. No one else can see them. She said that there was evidence helpful to her on that phone also. But notice when, about the testimony. When she started her journey back to Wisconsin after finding out her brother had been arrested, she didn't bring that phone with her. She didn't bring Michael's phone. She hid it. And not in her own apartment in Maui, but in a friend's apartment in Maui. And it was only discovered because the Kenosha detectives flew to Maui, and they talked to people she knew, and someone gave them the phone from her friend Derek's apartment or wherever he was staying. The only evidence on that phone was evidence that hurt her the text messages that she sent him, luring him out of the house so that she could kill him. Because by then, she had already deleted the messages from her phone. The months of planning between April and July, she had deleted that. Derek had deleted that. So it was only Michael's phone that she had to keep hidden. Michael's phone containing the pictures, Michael's phone containing the texts. And after that, she took, she called Derek and said, it's done. He took the phone from, excuse me, he took the gun from her. He cleaned it off. He was supposed to get rid of it, but he didn't. Instead, a few days later, he gives it to his ex-wife, Sherry Matthews, you heard her testify, for safekeeping. And he took the shells from the bullets Donna fired and threw them into the lake which was the plan all along. Delete messages, get rid of evidence, avoid detection, lie, lie, lie. And Donna goes out to eat with her family the next day. She looks pretty happy, doesn't she? She doesn't look like a woman. So she flies back to Hawaii and resumes her life. Life is good. She feels good in Maui. She feels safe in Maui. And less than two weeks after returning to Hawaii, she gets her commemorative tattoo, one that Naomi Kosick told you symbolized the happiness, peace, and love she felt on the 4th of July when she killed Michael Gann. Now, Naomi's been around the block a few times. You heard her testify. But this shocked her. And it should shock anyone with a conscience. Look at the picture. This is the day she got the tattoo. She took this picture of herself, and she sent it to her friend Derek Short, the one who tried to help her lure Michael to Hawaii so she could push him off a cliff. She looks pretty smug, pretty proud of herself. almost bragging. Look at what I did. Look at what I got away with. Here's my reminder forever. So why? We don't have to prove motive in a case. The judge read you that instruction. But in this case, the motive was so apparent. And it had nothing to do with defending herself against death or great bodily harm. Donna Matthews was living a fiction 
with her friends and her family, and Michael was threatening to expose that. She has lied passionately and dramatically to her friends and family, and because of that, they turned on Michael, and they took on her perceived battles. She selectively gave them part of the script that she wanted them to have, and so it's no shock that they have adopted her storyline, and they have taken on her lies as the truth. And the last thing she could allow is to have her fiction and have her lies exposed. What's ironic is that those lies have been exposed here in the courtroom. Because she thought, you know, she thought that when you heard her say, oh, I was in imminent danger, Michael's threatened to kill me, Michael's threatened to kill my daughter, Michael's threatened to burn down my brother's house, that you would believe her, just like all her other friends had in the past. But you have the big picture. They didn't have the big picture when they believed her. You have the big picture, and you know for certain that this is just more of the fiction that she hopes you will buy into so that you'll take on her battle. You know the truth about Donna Matthews. And you remember when Detective Korea first got on the witness stand, we started, we got lie, 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 lie. Donna Matthews, cross-examination. Lie, lie, lie. Why did I do that? Because I wanted you to know, even before she uttered a word, that she was a liar. Years of lying. July 4th, 2015, here's a lie. She collapses to the ground because Michael is walking by. She grabs a friend's skirt to cover her face. She's just terrified because Michael's walking by. It's the 4th of July, it's the lakefront. Thousands of people are there, according to Lori Matisse. She test, Donna Matthews testified. She jumped up and ran to the scooter as soon as she could to get away from him. Truth? Her daughter, Sydney, had embarrassed her with her stripper clothing and behavior in front of her conservative friends. You heard those messages between Ms. Matthews and her daughter, Destiny. I had to leave the party because of your sister, because she was embarrassing me. It had nothing to do with Michael walking by. But isn't it better to have Michael be the fall guy? Let Michael be her excuse to run away from the party instead of admitting to her friends that she's humiliated by her own daughter. Michael lived within a block of the lakefront. There was no testimony that he interacted with any of the people at this party. No testimony that he was specifically looking for Donna Matthews, just walking by. But you know what? You get more attention from your friends when Michael's the problem. And you divert attention away from your daughter, which is your source of embarrassment. Lie. She called Shelby and Lori Matisse in February 2015 to rescue her from Michael. He's knocking on the doors and the windows. Well, Lori Matisse testified. There was a police report. Michael had left when Donna asked him to. She didn't tell him Shelby that, did she? <coughs> Lie. Damon and Shaleen's dog disappears. She never tells them that Michael couldn't have had anything to do with this because he was with me in Santa Fe. We're traveling together. Things are good. Nope. She doesn't say that. New Orleans. She lied to you about what happened in New Orleans. She had to leave New Orleans because she didn't feel safe there anymore. Michael knew she was there. He sent a picture of her. Oh, excuse me, a picture of the rental unit where they were staying. But shockingly, once again, that's a picture that cannot be found. Detective Korea looked. He looked on Donna's phone. He looked on Michael's phone. There's no picture. There wasn't even a picture sent between the two of them at that time. Her journals, we went through her journals. Detective Korea testified to this. There was no entry in her journal where she says, oh my God, Michael's at it again. Oh my God, Michael knows where I am. It's just another lie. 
Colorado. She moves on to Colorado. She tells her friends, you heard those messages, oh, I'm desperately trying to get away from him. I'm, I've been running and running and running from him. He follows me everywhere. He knows where I am. What's the truth? She told him to meet her there. She booked his hotel room. She sent the number of a spa so that he would pay for spa treatment for herself and her daughter on her birthday. Um, she's had her daughter send provocative pictures of herself to Michael to tempt him. She booked the hotel room close to where she was staying. Um, she testified that she hated the dirty, filthy sex with Michael, but she's the one who offers to bring the vibrator. She even sends a picture of it. Then she says in her journal, yep, first thing, yep, again, referring to sex. She invited him to her friend Shelby's house where she was staying, and she had sex with him there too. And she, they started traveling together. She says she had to. She had to follow his orders. But the truth is, when I showed her the messages she sent him at that time, the one saying she loved him and loved his romance, well, then the story changes. Okay, well, that was apparently just a brief moment when things were good. Next slide. He forced me to drop the restraining order in Kenosha. Forced me. How many times has she uttered this threat to a variety of people? He forced me to drop the restraining order. He made me do it. Well, the restraining order was dropped a few days after those loving messages that I've read to you that have been testified to in November of 2015. That was when he, Matthew, excuse me, Michael, drives her back to Kenosha because her daughter, Sydney had been hospitalized. She spends some time in Kenosha. She drops the restraining order. And then, because their relationship is going well, they leave together again and resume their travels back to Arizona, stopping along the way to visit some sites. Next slide. Dayton. She calls Dayton for help leaving Arizona. She had to get away from Michael. Um, he had to book her hotel. He had to book her travel plans. But she never, ever told him that they had been traveling and living together before she came to Dayton's house in North Carolina. Did you see his reaction when I asked him if he knew that fact, if he knew that they had been living together when she made this big dramatic escape from Arizona? No. I didn't. He was angry. And he said he had maintained contact with Donna during this time. They had been in communication. And never once did she tell him that she was traveling with Michael and living with Michael. Her lie was exposed here in court, just as it was with David, who testified about Donna's dramatic reaction to Michael walking down the street on July 4th of 2015. But guess what? She didn't tell David, well, but then I, I started traveling with him after that. What's also clear is that she didn't tell Dayton after, she, after arriving in North Carolina. Excuse me. What she didn't tell Dayton after this big dramatic escape from Arizona is that after spending three weeks at his house, bad-mouthing Michael, calling him a stalker, she started making plans to meet Michael in Chicago. And she offered to bring cocaine and Viagra. There was explicit sexting between them during that time. If you are so afraid of this man, Michael Gann, and what he might do to you, do you give him cocaine? She lied to Detective Hagen. Detective Hagen testified. He talked to her on the phone after um, Michael's body had been discovered in the beginning phases of the investigation. She told Detective Hagen that within an hour of arriving in North Carolina at her brother's house, Michael had sent a message with her brother's address. He had found her again. She was so dramatic when she said this to Detective Hagen. So emotional. Can you believe it? Again, he finds me everywhere. 
But you heard her brother testify. He listened to a voicemail from Michael a week after Donna arrived in North Carolina. And Michael was tearful. And Michael said, I don't know where you are. There was no threat to kill her or anyone else in that tearful message from Michael. And if ever there was a time for that kind of message to come through, don't you think it would be then? She left without any notice from Arizona. He goes to the club. She, he comes back. She's gone. He has no idea where she is. Also in that call to Detective Hagen, she lies to him by talking about Michael in the present tense. He's still bothering me. Oh, my gosh. It's as if he's still alive. So much emotion during that phone call. She had to make it sound convincing, and you know she's had lots of practice lying convincingly to friends and family. Chicago. So many lies about Chicago, I started to lose track. Um, she lied to her friends and family about where she was during those specific days. She lied about why she needed Viagra and for whom she needed it. She lied about why she was looking for cocaine. She told her brother Derek she was, it was for a girl's weekend or a girl's trip. She even lied to you about where she got it. The messages show that she got it from a friend of her friend of Stace Tenuta's. But when she testified, she just had to get a dig into Josh Taylor and accuse him of selling her the cocaine. Why? Because he dared come to court and testify against the perfect Donna Matthews? The victim Donna Matthews? She lied that Michael drugged her to take the provocative pictures. But you saw those pictures. Does it look like Michael is forcing her to use cocaine in this picture? Does it look like she needs any help getting the cocaine off her nose? She willingly used cocaine, but she can't have her friends know that. That might impugn her reputation or her image with them. Oh, he drugged me to take those nasty pictures. Well, look at the picture. This is one, one picture. I didn't know he was taking these pictures. I'm sure he did. Of course she did. She's looking right at it. You can see his reflection right there in the glass. She's drawing a But you can't let your friends know that. They might think there's something wrong with you. I don't know. People take pictures during sex. I, I, but apparently this is a big deal to Donna Matthews, something she can't let her friends know. There were messages that you've heard where Michael asks Donna Matthews for permission to record them having sex because he thinks it's beautiful. <clears throat> And she doesn't say no. He brought a tripod. There was a message. You brought the, he says, I brought the tripod. What, she didn't see the tripod? <clears throat> she lied and said she hated every minute of that weekend. She testified to that. But her journal says the opposite. Her journal says, good first day, sex four times. Did the whole bag almost by myself. I don't know if you're counting. I tried. I think at this point we're up to 21 lies, give or take. She expanded the initial plan for Chicago from a two-day visit to a four-day visit, despite her claim of fearing him and not wanting to be with him. She goes back to Kenosha after that with Michael, lies about where she's staying. She doesn't tell her friends and family she's staying with Michael. Only Stace Tenuta, apparently, knew. 
She lied when she said he held her things hostage. But she testified when she left Arizona in December of 2015, she left her things behind. She testified that when she was in Kenosha in January of 2016, before leaving for Hawaii, she dropped Michael off at the airport, and then she spent the night and the next day at his house. <clears throat> she didn't take her things. In fact, she brought more of her belongings over to store them there. She lied to her brother Derek about where she was staying the night before he drove her to the airport. She did not want him to know she was staying at Michael's. So instead, you heard those messages where she races back and jumps out of the car just in time. She lied when she told you she never told Michael she was moving to Maui. She would never tell Michael she was moving to Maui. But the truth is, she did. And you heard that message, too. Michael says in a very sad message before she even leaves for Hawaii, I'm so sad that you're moving to Maui. Lie. She didn't want him to know where she was. She didn't want him to follow her. She wanted to be done with him when she went to Maui. And yet, he's one of the first people she texts when she arrives in Maui. And not only does she send a text saying she arrived, she sends pictures of herself. She sends a picture of her morning margarita with the cocktail napkin exposed, showing the name of the hotel in Lahaina where she is staying. But she lied to you about that too. Oh, I, didn't send the, I did not send that picture with the cocktail napkin to Michael. I posted that on Facebook. Oh, really, Ms. Matthews? Here it is. She sends pictures of herself and a friend at a beach. Really? She didn't want him to come? Wasn't she basically tempting him with all of that? She says... She lied and said she didn't agree to him coming. She didn't want him there. But you know the truth. She did want him there. She says one thing, does another. She invited him to places. She took him to dinner. She showed him around. She told him... I will spend time with you. This is February 24th, 2016. We will have walk time, talk time, meal times, erotic time, and maybe even some sleepovers. And she did. She let him spend the night. Because then you heard a message where she says to Michael, yes, come over. Because once Joy comes back, remember Joy spent um, about a week with her husband. When her husband came to visit, they stayed at a resort. She tells Michael, because when Joy gets back, no more sleepovers. Then we get to the lies about Joy. Poor Joy Hulse, embroiled in this drama. Donna Matthews tells her, don't tag me on Facebook. I don't want Michael to know where I am. Even though she knew, he already knew. Why would Joy, why would, let me start over. Michael would have no reason to check Joy's Facebook page. He didn't know, according to Donna, that Joy was moving, excuse me, that Donna was moving there. Um, Joy didn't even know Michael, had never met him, didn't know his last name. What reason would Michael have to look at Joy's Facebook page? It's easy for Donna Matthews to lie and blame Joy for Michael being there when it was, in fact, Michael who when it was, in fact, Donna Matthews who told him where she was without ever having to admit to anyone that she told him. The keys. Remember, Joy talked about the keys. Um, she came home one night. She was struggling a little bit with the lock to get in. She had been drinking a little bit. Um, she went inside. She had this very specific routine because Donna was a very particular roommate. She puts her shoes, her keys, the things that she will need for the next morning because she wakes up very early and Donna Matthews does not like it when she is disturbed in the morning. 
Donna accuses her the next day of losing the keys, of leaving the keys in the lock. And then Donna Matthews accuses Michael of stealing those keys and of trying to use those keys to get into the apartment. But you heard Detective Correa read a message that Donna Matthews had sent her friend Emily Bankhead just a few hours earlier, a few hours before Joy came home. I just had a crazy thought. What if Michael knocks down Joy after she has been drinking and takes her keys? Then he would have the keys to my apartment. Wow. Just, wow, what predictive abilities Donna Matthews has. She previews the story to her friend Emily Bankhead, and then she makes it happen. She makes the keys disappear, and then she blames Michael. I, this is insight into her warped mentality. Her scooter. She texts Tony Rash. Oh, Michael's blowing up my phone. I can't get away from him. He's blowing up my phone. Oh, okay, well, let's look at the messages that Michael is sending where he's blowing up your phone, Ms. Matthews. Oh, you asked him for help to fix your scooter. And he's texting you about how to help you fix your scooter. What's the model? Uh, where's the manual? Um, tell me exactly what happened. I'll call a place in Lahaina and see if they have the parts that you need. He wasn't even in Hawaii. He's trying to do a good deed, and he can't even get credit for that. She has to lie about even that. Her lie to Elizabeth Billings her lie to you in court when she testified about it. Elizabeth Billings, uh, in December of 2015, Donna called me. She was on the bathroom floor of the casita. She sounded terrified. She was curled up on the floor. Michael had drugged her. Well, Donna Matthews testified that she took a handful of pills. And that's why she was on the floor of the casita, the bathroom floor of the casita. Donna didn't call the police. Why call Lizzie? Why call Elizabeth Billings, who lives in Michigan, when you're in Arizona? What is Elizabeth Billings supposed to do, even if she does believe that you've been drugged by your boyfriend? She lied about having a three-day breakdown in Arizona. She texted her best friend, Stace Tenuta, that she was faking, faking nutso, so she could get away from Michael. There was no breakdown. She lied when she said he held her hostage there for days. You saw the pictures, though. These are the days after this so-called breakdown where he's holding her hostage. That doesn't look like a hostage situation to me. Does it look like one to you? She lied when she said that she couldn't get away from him. This was on direct examination. She said, when after this breakdown um, on Thanksgiving, she couldn't get away from him. He wouldn't let her out of his sight until finally he left to go to the fitness club and she was able to make her escape. Hmm. On cross-examination, though, she has to admit that, wait, that's not true, because not only were the, there those pictures where you got out, but you actually left for an entire day and night and spent the day with your friend Roxanne. Doesn't sound like a hostage situation to me. And then she only left him. She only made the decision to leave him after he told her he was broke and needed money. Now that was the final straw for her. She lied in the restraining order for Maui and to her brother David and others that Michael had threatened to burn the house down. That Maui restraining order, you heard it just yesterday, in fact. <clears throat> 
It was a very specific statement. He sent me a text on March 11th, 2016. And using quotation marks, she writes, your brother will be dead with the phone call. All it takes is a phone call and your brother's home will be burned down. Don't push me or your kids will die. Well, Detective Korea looked for that message. He looked at the dates that date, the days before, the days after, and guess what? There was no such message from Michael Gann. She didn't attach it to the restraining order, even though she's admitted that she saved all the messages from Michael. You know why Detective Korea couldn't find it? Because it didn't exist. It's just more lies and drama from Donna Matthews. <coughs> she lied about the sexual assault. Oh, Michael, Michael forced himself on her? She already promised him erotic times when he got there. You saw these pictures. This is just one of a few of them together in the days that, they were, that he was there. She doesn't claim that there was any sexual assault when she petitioned for the restraining order. She didn't call the Maui police to report a sexual assault. And in the jail calls that you listen to, she says, I never said there was any physical violence. Well, I think a sexual assault qualifies as a physical violence. She lied to Detective Hagen about being at the OP on July 4th of 2016 when in fact she was trying to get an alibi from Christina Schroeder. And when she found out that the OP was closed on July 4th, she tried to find out where Christina was. Well, maybe I can just say I was with you, Christina, right? The inf inference is that, Christina, you'll lie for me and pretend that I was with you on July 4th. But she didn't like that because Christina was actually at the lakefront pretty close to Michael's house. She lied to you when she said she was going to turn herself in. Who looks for an alibi and lies to a police officer who is investigating the death of another person if you are planning on turning yourself in? Who hides the phone belonging to the murder victim? She called Ryan Waite and told him to shut up about her search for a gun. Not one more word, not another word. She called Kara Crossland, shut your boyfriend up. He's telling people that I am a murderer. She told Kara that the police had the person who did it in custody. Except at that time, the only person they had in custody was Derek. They didn't have Donna in custody. She says that the turning point was this threat to Sydney. She knew she had to leave the safety of Maui where she felt protected by the distance and the restraining order because she needed to protect Sydney. But you heard the messages between Ms. Matthews and her friend Stace Tenuta, June 9th of 2016. I am blown away that my kid has told Michael all of this shit. I am sick. I'm disgusted. I'm so effing angry at her. Angry. Not scared. Angry. Time for me to walk away from that ungrateful, selfish child. She has no idea how much she has hurt me. And if she does, she doesn't give a fuck. His background on his Facebook is us sexting, and she wants to spend time with this fucking maniac. She wasn't interested in protecting Sydney because there was nothing to protect her from. You... You heard testimony about these voice notes, the voice note that she um, sent to Destiny, where she was so upset that Sydney was being disloyal to her by spending time with Michael. There was the lie about the baby book, this baby book that Naomi Kosick and Heather Lindgren testified to. This letter, these pages in the back telling Sydney all the things she should remember if she testified. 
Oh, well, I, she says, Ms. Matthews lies to you and says, well, I just wanted to make sure she understood the importance of remembering those things. Really? She had phone calls with Sydney. She had visits with Sydney. She could write letters to Sydney with a postage stamp that would go through the mail. But she didn't do it that way because she didn't want any of us to know that she was coaching her daughter to lie. All of this is because the real motive had nothing to do with imminent danger to herself or her daughter or family. This is just a convenient excuse now to help her get out of trouble and to protect her image with her friends and family and once again paint Michael as the bad guy and herself as the victim. Because what all the lies have in common is that it makes her, it preserves her image as the victim and it makes Michael the bad guy. Now, when I counted, that was about 40 lies. And when you multiply that by the number of people she told these lies to, it gets into the hundreds. Because this is how much she values and treasures her reputation. Not any fear of being hurt or killed. She was never afraid of him hurting her physically or him hurting anyone else physically. And you know why? Because when I read her those hateful messages she sent to Michael, remember? Well, were you afraid of him when you sent this message? Well, um, I wasn't thinking then. July of 2015, she tells her daughter... to post something on Facebook about Michael. Um, he will. De she says to her daughter, no pictures he can bring that to court. So she's already thinking ahead of how to collect evidence herself and how other people can collect evidence. But he will definitely, definitely know you were talking about him and will be so angry. I like that. doesn't sound afraid to me. Well, she says, well, I wasn't afraid of making him angry then because I was leaving Kenosha. But in fact, she didn't leave Kenosha until September. December of 2015, she sends a hateful message. He didn't know where she was. She was far away from him. She said she didn't care if she got him angry because she didn't think he would come. Now, this is the person that she called the Terminator. Does it jive? Does it make sense? Or are all her lies colliding? March of 2016, she had him served with a restraining order. She says to him, fuck off. Go fucking do the world a favor and die, you thieving, lying, creepy freak show. Lose my number, forget my name, and stop breathing. For the love of God, I fucking can't stand breathing the same air as you do on this island that will eventually hate you and spit you out like I do. Good fucking by forget my name I hope you fucking die of a worse nasty cancer there has ever been karma is a bitch you thief liar piece of shit well Ms. Matthews weren't you afraid when you sent him that message he was still in Maui well no um, uh, I had him served with the restraining order and I felt protected by the restraining order April 27th of 2016, I asked her about that hateful message. Well, Ms. Matthews, weren't you afraid of him? You said you were always afraid of him. Weren't you afraid of him when you sent that message where you said, no one wants you around. You're a total crazy, sick in your head fucking monster. God wants you gone as well. He knows you're a walking evil. 
Go be with your twin brother, Satan. He's waiting for you. Don't message me again. I wish you would drop dead. Stop fucking messaging me and go die somewhere. It's April 27th of 2016. Oh, well, her excuse for that one was, well, Michael was off the island. He was far away, so she wasn't afraid of making him mad. Even though her brothers were still in Kenosha and her daughters were still here, apparently that fear did not exist at that time. She felt protected by the distance from Maui to Kenosha in April of 2016, but apparently that distance didn't protect her in July of 2016, in her mind. Again, I can't repeat it enough. The truth of the matter is she had no reason to fear Michael. He would never physically hurt her. And in all the years they were together, 2010 onward, after all their ugly breakups, he never hurt her. And she said it, and you heard it. Two calls, specifically in conjunction with some messages to friends. <clears throat> Never one time did we say he was beating me and it was physical. I mean, it was mental. I guess it was emotional abuse. You know, there was no place where we seen physical violence. We never said that. But, you know, and these messages are from October of 2016 and November of 2016. But, you know, um, he just talked about physical violence. This is about the prosecutor. We never said it was physical violence. You know, we never said that. But he kept saying hundreds, and pa hundreds of pages, and no, not one place did it say. Well, no, it didn't, because it never happened. Stop saying that, you know? Even when she testified, she said... No hitting, no punching, no kicking, no slapping, no kicking. What she says is he held her by the note, excuse me, by the neck twice. When? He left Maui in the middle, or he left Maui in March of 2016. Well, you heard the messages yesterday. He, when she throws out that accusation, you scared me when you grabbed my throat or when you held me by the throat. I can't remember exactly what the words were. And he says, well, that was during sex, that we were being playful. Um, you had no reason to fear that. And even if she did, would that cause someone to fear death four months later? No evidence that it hurt her. No evidence that her breathing was impeded or restricted. Because it was, just as Michael said, playful, erotic behavior. Of all the people that she reached out for to help, friends, women helping women, Maui police, Kenosha police, when this so-called threat to Sydney came in in June that caused her to book her own ticket to come back to Kenosha in July, her so-called turning point, she calls none of them to tell them about it. If Michael had really made this threat in June of 2016, don't you think she would have called them all to tell them? She called them about everything else. Facebook posts, electronic messages from Michael, text messages, emails, him being at the park across the street from her, knocking on her door. But not this, because it's another one of her made-up lies. And by then, she had already been planning to kill him for months anyway. Her emails to Sergeant Cooper. She liked Sergeant Cooper. He seemed sympathetic. Those messages weren't a cry for help that Michael was going to kill her if she didn't come back to him. She said in April of 2016, which, mind you, was when she started planning to kill him, I do not want to spend the rest of my life worrying he's posting nasty pictures on Facebook and feels he can contact me anytime he wants. Her June 23rd, 2016 email to Sergeant Cooper, 11 days before she kills Michael, she says, I don't have it. 
Oh, here we go. He has given me no choice. I have to come back to Wisconsin. I don't know what to do. I mean, literally, I would hand my phone over and let you read all the messages I've been dealing with. This is what it is. Michael is blackmailing me to be with him. He posts those pictures on Facebook. And when I don't do what he wants, I have to do... When I don't do what he wants, I have to do what he wants and tell him I'm going back to him or he will post these pictures. I have no choice. He has a list. He has a list of 700 plus people in my life. Their names, their phone numbers, or emails. He sent that to me. I can't have that. He promises the next group of people that will get the Facebook request will be the people I work with here on the island. I have been humiliated more than you can imagine. I cannot have him keep posting these pictures when I don't tell him the nasty things he wants me to tell him. This has nothing to do with being afraid of dying or being killed or being hurt physically or having anyone in your family be hurt that way. She doesn't even ask him, look, Michael has threatened to hurt my daughter. Can you please go check on her? Can you please find a safe place for her? Can you send some extra squads? No. June 23rd, 24, 25, 26, 27, 28, 29, 30, 1, 2, 3, 4. 11 days that she just leaves her daughter dangling with this threat, this fear of imminent danger from Michael without asking for assistance on that regard. And the next day after that email from Sergeant Cooper on June 23rd, she books her ticket to Wisconsin. And she tells Michael, I guess it has to work. I don't want to put a gun in my mouth, LOL, meaning I can't live with the horrific Facebook. I've been humiliated beyond recognition, but I guess you did what you felt you had to do. June 30th, in her calendar, Again, I'm being threatened by Michael. He told me he will be putting pictures of my journal on Facebook. I seriously don't know how much more I can take. I hate him so much. He is the epitome of evil, and that's all. He is evil and should not be allowed. So the legal question for you as jurors is not where on the spectrum of dysfunctional relationships does this one fall, or how unlikable was Michael Gann? You may think Michael Gann was a horrible person. Um, He did some terrible things. He humiliated her by posting these pictures and these screenshots of the sexting, which he believed was exposing her lies. You may believe all of that, but that's not what matters here. Here what matters is whether she intended to kill him and whether she did it, and whether she believed she was terminating an unlawful interference, imminent death, or great bodily harm. Use your common sense, your, your knowledge of the world in knowing what imminent means. It means immediate, close by, near at hand, on the point of beginning. It doesn't mean maybe sometime in the future, if I make him angry enough, he may do this to me. It doesn't mean distant, escapable, future, far, later, avoidable, unlikely, or maybe. And it certainly doesn't mean if I imagine it and say it enough times in court, then it's true. Because where was the danger to her on July 4th of 2016? There was none. Or in any of the days before that. There was no danger from the time she started planning this in April with her brother. There was no imminent danger when she tried to lure him to Hawaii and feed him to the sharks or when she allowed her daughter Destiny to fly in early, and when she didn't warn a single person that there was this imminent threat. There are 31 days in May, 30 days in June, four days in July. All that time, this imminent threat is hanging out there. That is not the definition of imminent. In all of their many breakups, and you've heard about just about all of them, um, Kenosha in July of 2015, Arizona 
in December of 2015, January of 2016, when she left him to go to Maui, um, March of 2016, when she gets the restraining order, has him arrested, and he has to leave Maui, was there ever any physical violence? Not before the breakup, not during the breakup, and not after the breakup. And in fact, you heard, after the Maui breakup, after he's forced to leave the island, he texts her and asks if he can send her some pizza from her favorite restaurant in Chicago. So now that you know the truth about Donna Matthews, you should not fall victim to her manipulations and her lies the way the others have. A man is dead. And as Naomi Kosick said, this man was a son. He was a brother. He, no human being deserves this. And she did it. And she did it with methodical pre-planning for months. And this is why you should reject this preposterous claim of self-defense and find her guilty of first-degree intentional homicide while armed and the burglary while armed. Thank you. Good morning again. Well, it's not morning now, I guess. We've had a lot of mornings together, uh, a lot of afternoons in these last two-plus weeks. And I'm grateful to each of you for your attention during this time it's not always been stimulating, uh, sometimes tedious, but we've watched you as you've watched us, and we've noticed focus and patience, and for that we appreciate it. Um, as you've seen, uh, this is not a, a made-for-TV uh, drama. These trials on television, there's a beginning and an end, and in 45 minutes you've got an allegation, an investigation, a trial, and a verdict. This is obviously much different than that. Um, so indebted to your attention. Also indebted to my team, Pat, Jillian, Jacob, our CR crack investigator, Susan Swanson, is here. There's been a lot of people contributing to the defense of Donna Matthews, and we believe in her defense. So, if in escaping from a terrorist, a, uh, a captive kills her captor, we don't condemn her, we give her a medal, give her a parade. Donna concluded that escape was impossible and she needed to instead concentrate on survival. And yes, ultimately, she had to be proactive in the elimination of this threat. How many times she tried leaving him? It's innumerable, and I won't laundry list them for you. You heard the evidence. All this discussion about lies and multipliers and telling her friends, I'm sorry, we don't buy that. The prosecutor's definition of a lie apparently is she doesn't like the answer. You do not construct what a lie is from a social media blitz from people who've been engaged in three terabytes of exchanging data. What you should do is listen to the evidence from the, from the uh, witness chair and the exhibits, and you determine what's truthful, and you determine what's valid. You know, I, I um, heard the prosecutor just now referred to Michael Gahan as bothersome. I didn't think I was going to hear uh, a bigger understatement than I heard during jury selection and during the opening statement when he was referred to as obnoxious. Um, I'm sorry, that is not, that's insulting to your intelligence to call this man bothersome. And I will talk about the effect of this person on Donna Matthews and how this all played out and why and what it means. Prosecutor said, Donna Matthews is manipulating Michael Gahan. Uh, I don't think so, folks. You heard the evidence, and that's what's really important, what you, how you heard the evidence. To call him bothersome and obnoxious, 
to do so with the knowledge of all of the thousands of texts and emails and, and the explicit fears that Donna Matthews relayed to you and, ex and exhibited in these texts and emails and other communications, it's just not credible. So again, we can't construct a reality from a social media existence. You can't pick out a handful of, or you, can't, or you can try a handful of messages and say, this is the reality of life. You can't do that. You have to, that's why we have trials. We have trials so that you can hear people come in and testify and tell you what happened. So it's a distortion to portray anybody's life as a collection of texts. There are some important ones, to be sure, but that does not define in-person interaction. We had to find, of course, our own examples of these um, uh, messages that were sent between Donna and Michael Gahan to counter the state's mind-blowing, cherry-picking of thousands and thousands of text and trying to create a narrative from that. It's misleading. And I had to, I found irony yesterday when we put on a witness and we read some text and the prosecutor accused us of taking things out of context on cross-examination. It's, it, it's, it's nonsense. So I urge you to, when you deliberate, to think about the testimony that you heard in open court. We hope that you believe Donna Matthews. In the, from, she sat on that witness chair for three grueling days. She gave context to a desperate situation above and beyond the carefully selected unrepresentative text messaging and Facebook posts that you just heard about for an hour and 10 minutes. It's as if the prosecutor does not recognize Donna Matthews' suffering and what impact that had on her decisions and how it left her with really no decision. There's the uh, stalking, and I, th the, I wish there were a better word for it, but that's what it is. There was the physical following of Donna from place to place in one locality, um, everywhere around that locality, and to other destinations. Do you really think Donna Matthews wanted to see Michael Gahan when he stalked her to Hawaii? You heard this exchange from um, January 30th, 2016. I don't want you to come here. I've told you that repeatedly. This is my time. I have my life to get together. I have zero time for you. Why don't you understand that? And then a series of exclamation points. <coughs> there are many more of those that we read for you. And I will not, you heard the evidence. And we rely on your memory for that evidence. And in any case, they are exhibits admitted into the trial. Those photographs that you, that the prosecutor showed you, well, at least one from Hawaii, where Donna is on a balcony with Michael Gahan, those were forced. Donna Matthews did not want to be there. She testified to that. And if, I'd like you to take a close look at that photograph when you get it. She showed it to you about them on this veranda looking out. You can see the body language. You can see that Donna's not happy about that. He's leaning into her. Her explanation was crystal clear about what she was doing in Hawaii with, with him. She was trying to mollify him, to appease this relentless stalker, buying time. Perhaps he would leave. Perhaps one day he would leave her alone, but he never, ever would. She, Gayan stalked her friends. What does that say about Gayan's need to control her entire existence? How do you think Liz Billings felt when she saw, knew that that was Gayan out in her alley one night? How do you? That's not in evidence. Overruled. 
How do you think she felt in that dark alley looking out there and seeing him sneak away? How do, how do you think she felt about him calling her at Starbucks in Kalamazoo, Michigan while she was standing in line? He stalks her friends. How do you think Shelby Degner felt about having him staring at her all of a sudden four feet away in some random parking lot? How do you think Emily Bankhead felt seeing him behind her on his motorcycle that he had shipped to Maui, clearly intending to stay there as long as he could? Do you think that those photos that she took of him were as a memento, some sort of memento so she could remember this man? He's acting like he doesn't see her. Please, how do you think Emily felt about that? She liked taking a photograph of Michael Gann? Did you see the look on Emily Bankhead's face when I asked her, did you know Michael Gann? It was pain. It was anguish. There was cyber stalking, of course. And Michael Gain gave, is a, gave us a master class in cyber stalking, how you can overcome blocked social media accounts, how you can flood Donna Matthews with text after text, no matter where she is, no matter how many times she begs you not to reach her, not to contact her. Whenever she was out of his presence, whether or not with his consent, flooding her, flooding her, cyber stalking, controlling her, and it was portable how he could do that. I'm going to talk some more about Dr. Hanusa in a few minutes, but this is an example of control that abused women suffer under. The tactics that Gayan used to control her were numerous, unrelenting, and they were painful. These are tactics that are used with hostages, with POWs, with kidnap victims. These are the kinds of things that pimps do to their prostitutes. That's how Gayan endeavored and succeeded in controlling Donna Matthews and instilling fear in her at all moments, at all times. Contacting her friends, her employers going and stalking her at a restaurant where she worked, sitting and staring at her from the bar when, until the boss of the place had to escort him out and he still wouldn't leave and she had to ha get somebody else to es escort him and tell him to leave. This is the reality that Donna Matthews was experiencing. This was the control that she suffered into that led into this cycle of abuse, which Dr. Hanusa discussed and I'm going to, I'm going to mention again. Shaming her, the outrageous long harangues on text where Gayan would call her out and tell her she's sleeping with everybody, that she's a whore, in all caps, whore. He made her her whore, his whore. That was his goal. These awful things that he would say. He would send pictures of himself with her father's ashes, with her dog tags on or laying nearby. This is control. This is horrific stuff, ladies and gentlemen. There was the blackmail. There was the intimidation. Threats to the family. Yes, there were threats to her daughter, Sid. Uh, by the way, bringing Destiny in from Turkey, Donna did not claim Destiny was subject to his threats. So that, that, was, that was one of the many misleading statements you heard in the initial argument. But yes, he threatened Destiny, and Donna confirms that in her text, why are you threatening my kids? The, remember the ominous trip to, to uh, Donna's mother's house that Derek described? How her, remember how her brothers had to get weapons because they were afraid of him? There was sexual violence in spades, folks. You heard Donna's <coughs> description of when he, this awful image of him showing up in Hawaii and escorting her, taking her by the neck, putting him, taking her with him to his room where he 
got a room right across the street from her after she begged him not to come, after she'd been fleeing him and ducking him and anguished about, get out of my life, he shows up in Hawaii across the street, and he leads her to this hotel room, and he has non-consensual sex with her. And don't let the prosecutors, uh, dis- uh, what can I say, um, uh, the way that the messages were tinkered with or were presented to you as if Donna wanted to have sex with this man, it's a classic symptom of an abused woman that you have to mollify or satisfy your abuser in hopes of doing what you can to buy time that ultimately this control will be released. That's exactly what Donna was talking about, and that's what the cycle of violence and cycle of abuse that Dr. Hanusa described for you. She submitted to him. He's choked her and strangled her against her will. We have that in text messages. There's an image that I did not publish for you but was admitted into evidence, and uh, you'll see it. It's a picture of Gay and uh, of Donna naked, leaning away from Guyan while he ejaculates on her. It's awful stuff. You tell me if that's love. Take a look at it, if you can. It's, it's representative of what she went through with this man. His insatiable appetite for one-way pleasure. Classic abuser conduct. I'm sorry, this man was not bothersome. He was a degenerate and a sadist. Ask yourself if those terms are too harsh when you review your own memory of what you heard, the evidence that we submitted, and some of these photographs. And lest there be any doubt about him, recall him referring to her landlord as a faggot and her friend and military close colleague, African-American Sergeant Graves as, forgive me, a nigger. This is who we're dealing with. This is the bothersome guy. This is the obnoxious guy. You can, you can understand why nobody came in to speak for Michael Gahan. I, I, the prosecutor makes... I'm going to ma- object at this point. This is improper argument. I disagree. <laughs> There was, did you notice the prosecutor's dismissive wave of the hand to Donna Matthews' friends and family in the gallery? Did you notice that? What's that about? These are people who love Donna, who came here on her behalf, who feel that this situation is meaningful, and I don't think that they appreciate that kind of gesture. Dane's body was discovered by workmen. It wasn't because somebody, and he lived on social media. Do you remember that? He, he lived there. It's not like some, if it, during those 24 or 25 days it was, that the police were contacted because we know they weren't by somebody who said, hey, I've been trying to reach Mike. There's no response. No, that's not what happened here. So while death is always a st- sad situation in virtually every case. Even for a narcissistic and violent stalker and abuser like Gahan, it is beyond debate that no person has lit a candle for Michael Gahan. There were threats to Donna in the hundreds. Some of the more notable ones, I'm not going to try, like the prosecutor, to list out every single thing that you've already heard, all of these supposed lies. <coughs> you remember the threat, one call, one shot. That was with reference to Michael Gahan saying he could take care of Derek Matthews with one call to his buddies in the Chicago Mafia. Is there any doubt that he could fulfill that? He talked about it Constantly. (laughs) 
We admitted evidence, into evidence texts. There was something from Michael Gay in saying this after Donna said, after he said, you pushed me too far, all bets are off. He says, you said something a week ago about what information I have on everybody. You have no idea. Talk about control. He's telling Donna he can find or do anything to anybody in her circle. You have no idea. And then he goes on to say, the same as to why I paid $18,000 for quote, he puts it in quotes, insurance to Chicago. That's the reason I had to go there for two fucking days. In case of plan B, well, it's plan B. You pushed it there. You know, know, now we both know the future. What do you think that means? We know what that means. Donna believed him and had a right to believe that this man would follow through on his threats. I'm not going to read you every text or try to get you to recount every single thing that was said like you heard in the first argument. But there were numerous references to Michael Gahan telling Donna about his connections that were going to end up as being terrible results for her and her family. Then there was the murder-suicide angle, which the prosecutor challenged when Donna was testifying, claiming, no, Donna, it was just suicide, wasn't it? From 12-30-2015, Donna's telling him, stop planning my life right now. Gayen says, the choice has been made. You know it, and I know it. He says, it's our life. And then he says, till death do us part. Then he goes on in another text on November 20th, 2016. I'll shoot for the last day so we get three days of great loving in before you die. You die, then I die. I'm ready. That's what he says. He's ready to die, and she's ready to die in his view, in uh, in his sick view of this relationship. Donna had a a right to rely on these threats, and she did. He treated her like property. He enticed her young daughter, Sydney, with material things. He invaded Donna's private space. He stole his way into her phones and her diaries. Do you remember the testimony about how he took her phone and he sent from Donna's phone scores of photos of Sydney to his own phone? That's what he did. Donna was on the witness stand for three days. I questioned her for the better part of one day, and the prosecutor kept going at her for over two more days. And again, just because she didn't like the answer, she goes back to some cherry-picked text and says Donna was lying, okay? That's That's what she's created for you in the initial argument. But you heard her testimony. So in all of that testimony... I, I, I hope you all noticed this. I certainly did. There was this exhaustive response, exhausted response by Donna to yet another of the endless questions by the prosecutor about why did you have sex with him during if you were having if this was such an ordeal. And the answer exactly was quote it wasn't you can't understand unquote. And that's exactly, a, that, that, is, that is the story. And that's a powerful response to the prosecutor's question, trying to explain what it's like to be a hostage and a fugitive to an unrelenting, deranged abuser. Trying to explain that to anyone with no context, particularly someone who doesn't want to understand. 
Fortunately, Dr. Hanusa helped you to appreciate the nightmarish experience of having your free will and your personal agency stolen from you by force, without any recourse, by your abuser, by your terminator. The terminator who would not relent, who would not stop, who you could do nothing to force to cease and desist and get out of my life. Dr. Hanusa's testimony helped to give Donna's experience true meaning and to help you, I hope, to understand what it's like to have been standing in Donna Matthews' shoes, suffering under the weight of her abuser. He helped take it out of the superficial realm of the naive, his word, formulaic reactions who, about people who don't understand abused woman syndrome, which he said, as you may recall, is synonymous with battered woman syndrome. There's a couple realities in this, in this uh, trial and in this whole situation that we live with, we had to live with. Donna is incarcerated in the Kenosha County Jail, and you saw how the state exploited that situation. They listened to her phone calls. They confiscated materials meant for her daughter. They read her mail. And then they encouraged a jailhouse informant. I'm not going to spend too much time on Naomi Kosick. She's a drug addict. You could see the track marks on her arms. I was amazed that the uh, people who, dra uh, who arranged for this testimony didn't have her wear a long sleeve shirt. She is not Donna Matthews' friend. Donna has real friends like Lori Matice and Shelby Deniger and Evelyn McCambridge and Emily Bankhead and Liz Matisse and Rob, who came in here and was the last witness for the defense. That's not her friend. She is not a good Samaritan. She's in it to help herself. But how about this one? This is the one of all of them. That I ask you to remember. And there's a reason I'm bringing her up. Not because she said anything harmful to Donna, or not because she said anything damaging, but, bec and I'll explain what that is, but there's an instruction you're going to get, or well, that you've already gotten from the, from the court, about uh, prior convictions. Evidence has been received that some of the witnesses in this trial have been been convicted of crimes, and it goes on to discuss how you can use that to consider the credibility of the witness. Naomi Kosick has 12 prior convictions. You can be in this business for 30 or 40 years and not see something remotely like that. So what you ought to do is take that convictions admonishment that you get in the instructions and multiply it by 12 and ask yourself how much do you credit do you want to give to this drug addict's testimony who's here being a good Samaritan and not looking out for herself. And I'm not saying any of this because I care what she said. Because what she said was common knowledge in the newspapers, in the, in the women's group that they were together in, in the showers where she saw the tattoo, in the jail where they heard conversation. No, no, that's got nothing to do with it. What this has to do with is it's demeaning to the process to present that type of evidence. It says much more about the, about the integrity of the state's case and their confidence in what they're presenting to you than it does about Donna Matthews. The only other person that you heard of in the, all the witnesses, every single witness who testified in this trial, who'd been convicted of a crime was Joy Hulse. And when you listen to her testimony and the way she described Donna and everything else, you should consider her credibility in the light of the fact that she has previously been convicted of a crime. There's this talk about fireworks ad nauseum. 
even if Donna wanted to do this while the fireworks were going on, it's irrelevant. You can see and understand how not getting caught for this was not high on Donna Matthews' priority list. This was the worst example of somebody trying to cover their tracks. The fireworks are irrelevant, as is the whether or not Gayen was sitting or standing when he was shot. I didn't think we were going to have to hear more about that, but we heard about it for 10 minutes in the prosecutor's closing argument. First of all, it's a false and misleading accusation that Donna shot him in the back. He was shot in the side. They call, she calls it the back. I don't care how many diagrams you put up. The pathologist testified he was shot in the side. Donna remembers that he walked in and she fired. It's very possible that he spun and one of the shots went into the side. That scenario of him sitting down, it doesn't make any sense. I don't care if an expert who talks about walls don't bleed and bullets don't go around corners, someone who talked to you like that, I don't care what he says. But the m most important thing to know, and then I'm going to move on from this totally silly discussion of sitting, is that it doesn't matter. Donna conceded more than once when she was testifying, I would have shot him if he were sitting or standing. So what's the big deal except to portray Donna in the worst possible light? And I'm going to talk about that. So. I had written some things about what I thought the state's approach to this case was, what they've been focusing on, and, cer and certainly it didn't take a genius, and I'm not giving myself too, credit, too much credit to say that what I heard in the hour and 15 or 10 minutes that the prosecutor spoke to you validated what has always been clear is what their approach to this case. One key component of their approach to this case is she can't be a battered woman because there's no evidence of physical abuse. And she's... And, and I hear that, and I'm thinking that we were, at the, we were in the same place, and we were hearing the same evidence. No, that whole concept, it seems that with regard to that proposition, promoted heavily from the beginning and again, that as with regard to that, the state's airtight case has sprung a leak because she was abused physically, mentally, emotionally, psychologically. But the prosecutor seems to make all... Makes, wants to make so much the fact that, you know what, I'll give you this. They didn't hit her over the head with heavy objects, causing her to be hospitalized, like he did to J.D. Holmes. I'll give you that. That does not equal, that that's not the sole indicator of physical abuse. How about the choking, the restraining, the blocking of her? You know why? Gayen learned a lot from his experience with the last woman that he abused. He learned a lot. He learned how to be measured. And by the way, Detective, uh, when Detective uh, Correa talked about, well, there's no indication of physical abuse in this case or on the text or in the restraining orders, well, when we cross-examined him, you hear when we pointed some things out to him, to his credit, because he's an honest man, he backed off of those claims. But more importantly, grotesque and violent physical abuse visited upon an abused person, woman by her abuser does not have to take the form of the brutal violence that Jamie Holmes suffered. Additionally, Dr. Hanusa's expert testimony, which I note, by the way, is unrebutted. You can infer that there are, are innumerable experts in this important discipline of battered women syndrome and post-traumatic stress uh, disorder arising out of battered women's syndrome. But none were offered to rebut Dr. Hanusa. Consistent with his testimony, Donna Matthews clearly falls within the definition of abused woman syndrome. Again, a subset, as Dr. Hanusa said, of post-traumatic stress disorder. Dr. Hanusa explained to you 
that battered woman syndrome is synonymous with abused woman syndrome. He made clear that in his experience and in the scholarly literature, uh, it, it is clear that emotional and psychological mistreatment of, abuser, of abused women by their abuser is reported to be worse by the women who endure this than physical abuse. And Gayen was a genius at this. He was manipulative, he was smart, he was practiced in this area. In any case, and I'm not gonna repeat it for you like the prosecutor did in her closing, because I trust you to remember these things. And we trust you to look at the exhibits, which include the restraining orders, which contain innumerable instances of Donna's fear of physical abuse, the threats of physical abuse, what she suffered from him, the legitimate fears that he was going to kill her, her constant pleas for help to, fam to family and friends corroborate his control, his abuse, his psychological, emotional, and yes, physical abuse. By the way, a word about restraining orders. We've talked about them a lot during this trial. They are legal, that's a legal document. Have you heard about that? You'll see it in evidence. That's a document, it's an order that is entered by a judge after having the opportunity to hear from both sides. Prosecutor diminishes Donna's statements in the restraining order? Well, apparently, it was good enough for a judge to grant it. Gayen has his say in both of those. He violated both of them. Violating restraining orders is consistent with the profile of a serial abuser. His efforts, in addition, to isolate her from friends and family by sharing explicit photos of Donna is consistent with an abuser, an intimidator, a manipulator. Donna's belief that she was in danger of death or great bodily harm was not unfounded, but rather substantiated by the trail of evidence, by the restraining orders, by the texts, by what we know happened to her. Even if Donna had successfully fled from Gayen, she believed she was not safe, and for good reason. Think about what happened here. She knew that it was only a matter of time before he would find her again. You'll read in his text, I'll find you. I'm going to find you. Doesn't matter where you go. Again, at her weakest moments, it's true, at her weakest moments, and there were many of them, because Gayen was a master of this, Donna would submit to him. Donna would say nice things to him. Donna would have sex with him. But it was all it was all part of this syndrome where you are trying to satisfy and hold off and deal in the only way you can as an abused woman with your abuser's unrelenting abuse. As a result of Gayen's continuous sexual physical, emotional, and psychological abuse and harassment, Donna was forced into, I guess we can call it a hyper-vigilant state where she believed that no matter where she was, she or, her own, or members of her family were at risk, imminent risk, of great bodily harm or death. His numerous threats against the lives of Donna, her children, her family, forced her to believe that she had no choice but to proactively terminate the threat. As long as he was alive, Donna and her family were constantly, moment to moment, at all times, under all circumstances, at risk for him to take action which he promised that he would do. Look at his threats. They're, they're, in, they're there in black and white. So, another predictable focus 
of the prosecutor's argument just a little while ago was it's all about the filthy photos. It's all about Facebook. We know that Don, that Gayen took these photos, hundreds of them, many of them, against her will and without her knowledge. We know that he sent them to all of her Facebook friends, including his sick decision to circulate this stuff to young children that Donna drew close to in India. Yes, indeed, it was beyond upsetting to Donna. And it's true that she said things at various times to certain people uh, that she was worried that he was going to continue blackmailing her some more with this. But to portray this as the reason that she had to shoot him is a distortion. It's a distortion of the reality that she was enduring and that I have discussed a few minutes ago. So this was part of a cycle of abuse, including threats of harm and death, that she knew he had the means, motive, and opportunity to carry out. So we had no interest in displaying for you the disgusting material that this sordid man was trafficking in. You'll notice that the discussion of this subject during the trial was virtually always brought up by the state. And same is true from the closing argument that you just heard. Here's another theme. And boy, did, the, did you hear about it just now. Donna Matthews is a disreputable woman. We heard that constantly during the trial. Prosecutors apparently made the calculation that if we can get you to have a low regard for her as a person, then that will narrow the contrast between her and who Michael Gayen was. They seem to ascribe to the theory that for a jury to convict somebody that charged, you, the jury, must feel personal antipathy towards my client. Well, don't buy it. Don't fall into that. Never mind that Donna has worked her entire life. She's been employed, often two jobs at a time. Never mind that she gave birth to two daughters and raised them for years as a single mom. And if, never mind that she served her country overseas for three years and trained for the war in Iraq, an army veteran honorably discharged. That she has a circle of friends who are respectable, real friends that obviously love her deeply, who we don't dismiss with a wave to the gallery, but who are real people with meaningful lives and care very much for this woman of substance. And their love, just a couple of examples, was obvious. Did you see Emily Bankhead when she looked at Donna, what it did to her to see her? Same with Liz Billings, who took the witness stand. But no. Prosecutors, instead, have preferred to present Donna as some kind of floozy. A whore, right? Sexual acts, four at a time, four on one night is all she cares about. They're pigeonholing her into what Michael Gayen wanted to make her. Her whore. Read the text. I won't offend you with what he said about her. Going on and on falsely about she's, she'll sleep with anybody. Again, in the closing and during the trial, portraying Donna as a bad mother, bringing up the tragic mental health issues that her daughter Sid has had for some time and which continue to plague her and Donna as well. Do we really need that? Does that advance the ball here? Does that prove guilt beyond a reasonable doubt? That she is an alcoholic? Have pictures of the margarita talking about her drinking we all like a drink once in a while, maybe more than once in a while. But people, our friends or people we don't know, don't condemn us for this. That she's a cocaine abuser. She testified that she'd used cocaine once when she was married about 10 years ago. And then at Gayen's insistence, she got cocaine for him and they used it on one occasion. That she's some sort of sex-starved woman. 
She's a callous daughter, manipulative sister. We heard the test. We heard her referred to in closing argument as warped. She even mocked Donna's voice and the voice of her friends, the prosecutor did, during her closing argument with that kind of sing-song. Well, no, what Donna, no, Donna really did this, or Donna said that. That's not argument. That's not relevant. That says more about the state's case than it does about the evidence against Donna Matthews. Portraying her as some sort of drama queen. How many times do we hear the word drama? So all of those things, all of those disparaging, unnecessary, personal insults against Donna Matthews, none of them are remotely true. How much did we hear just now about Donna's efforts to conceal, conceal her involvement in this shooting? There was plenty. She copped to it when she testified. She regrets it. She wishes that she had not tried to do that. She would have rather done something enormously difficult. She would have rather shortly afterwards said, I did this. I killed him. I'm coming back. Lock me up. But instead, she panicked, had a normal human reaction to this. She tried ineptly to cover her tracks, to figure out what, what can I do here. Is that so hard to understand? Does that have anything to do with her state of mind at the relevant times before the shooting and at the time of the shooting? Hagen was brought up, Detective Hagen, where she was on the phone, uh, even though, with Hagen, even though she knew, she knew that the body had been discovered before he called. And what does she do? She talks to him as if that weren't the case. And she testified about this. She was relieved that finally some Kenosha police officer who'd never tried to help her before was listening to her and taking things down and wanted to help. This was the kind of state of mind that continued with Donna after this all happened. But she knew Dan was dead. So law enforcement from Kenosha that had no interest in helping her when she needed it, was now offering fake help, knowing Gayen was deceased on their watch. But in the end, despite all of the time that the prosecutor spent on the post-shooting conduct of Donna Matthews, in the end, your focus should be on what led up to the shooting. What was her state of mind? What was going on there? What led her to do this? And whether or not she believed that there was an imminent threat to her and her family, and it was reasonable. I'm going to talk about the instructions in a few minutes. But the state doesn't agree with that. This is a consciousness of guilt approach that they're taking. Because of how she acted afterwards, you should draw that back to what she did before. But it's a stretch, folks. What really matters is what happened before. She, she does feel bad, but she doesn't feel guilty. She had to do this. She wishes it hadn't come to that. If he only weren't such a monster, if local police only would have helped her. But they did not. She ran out of options. Death or great harm to her family was imminent, and she reasonably believed that. As she said, she had to do this to save the lives of her family members and herself. Obviously, the fear of imminent death or great bodily harm was amplified when Donna Matthews had these conversations with Jamie Holmes in the spring of 2016. 
I want to talk about Derek for a minute, her beloved brother. There was another Hail Mary in the prosecution in the prosecution's case when she was questioning Donna and said to Donna, actually said this to Donna and did not repeat it just now. Weren't you really trying to get Derek to take the rap for the killing? That's the kind of hyperbola bordering on misleading evidence, quote unquote, that the prosecution's trying to use to get you to lose focus in this case. Nothing could be further from the truth. It's preposterous. It's obviously false. Trying to drive a wedge between Donna and her family, looking for another manner or way to disparage our client, it's beyond the pale and it's disturbing to suggest that. Do you really think David and Dayton would have come into this courtroom or would be coming to all of her court appearances when they could if they believed that or if the family believed that? They were here to defend their sister. By the way, this reminds me, I'm a little off, off my order here, but do you recall this talk about Donna being a callous daughter because she left town after her mother died and didn't stay for the funeral? Do you remember the misimpression that you were left with that in the state's case? And then we clarified it not just through Detective Korea, but more importantly through her brothers. There was no funeral. Her mom was cremated. Everybody left. They all got together right after she died. <coughs> Again, gratuitous efforts to disparage my client, Donna Matthews, who does not deserve that kind of thing. I want to talk for about five minutes about Derek and his testimony. One of the things that really was jumped out when he testified, when he was being asked by the state questions about Michael Gahan, you will remember this quote, when they asked him about, well, was he, did it seem like he was in love, or something led up to this answer, and what he said was, he was not a man in love, he was a man possessed. That's what Derek said to the prosecutor, hoping for, who hoped, was hoping for a better answer. These are some of the things that Derek told you when he testified. He told you that, and this is from his firsthand experience living next, practically next to Donna and knowing Gayan like few other people did, being exposed to him so often. He said every day Donna was afraid of getting killed or having her family getting killed. He said, I just did not want to lose my sister. Derek said, when I went to the police, I told you guys, this guy is threatening my family, me. He refers back to himself. And I didn't want nothing to do with this. And I kind of got the impression that my sister, either you're going to have to die or he's going to have to die. It's what it came down to with her. He, she was in fucking hell, to use his words. I couldn't do it for her. I could understand her agony, because you see it in somebody's eyes. He said, she would be dead. Haven't I told you how crazy this guy was with my sister's death? Now, this is a state witness, right? This is a person who got up there and wanted, the state wanted to say things that would help their case. In fact, they went to visit him in the jail before he testified to show him photos and text and all this other social media stuff to get him to hope, to, to him hope that he would now dislike Donna. And perhaps he wouldn't say these kinds of things when he testified. But their bubble was burst when he said things like he dropped the restraining orders because he threatened her, referring to Gayan. That's what he told me. That's what she told me. He threatened her family.
this guy would not leave her alone. He threatened to kill her. He threatened to kill people in her family. He knew where my mother lived. He went there. He scared the shit out of her. That's what he said. There's much, much more, much more of this. I'm not going to take up your time. You heard this. You remember this. Derek Matthews loved Donna. He f- still does. He fell f- felt for her very deeply. He was scared for her. He was threatened by gay and words out of his own mouth. And Donna knew all this. There were diaries. Prosecutor referred to the diaries and notes to herself that Donna Matthews kept. I know it's, I'm trying to plow through this, folks. I've got a little bit more to say. I know it's late. It's kind of hot. Bear with me. Here's a, here's an, uh, a diary entry from Donna Matthews. You've got these exhibits. They're photos of sheets of her notebook. Here's a diary entry on October 7th, 2017. The police seized these, this, these notebooks uh, at the Seattle airport from her luggage. You didn't hear any quotes from these uh, in the state's case. But what Donna said to herself then was, if I die today, please look at Michael Gahan. He did it. Another one of her diary entries. But if something happens to me, please contact. And then she goes on and leaves the names of people she wants you, someone to contact. And she refers to other people in this context and saying, I love you very much. Please make sure the girls give you $10,000 out of my life insurance. This is Donna in her diary. In what, December 6th, same year, I hope I live through the next three days. He might kill me. If he does, I hope it's quick and painless. Didn't hear about these in the state's case. So, premeditated, can't be self-defense premeditation, as it, and, and, and how much time did we sit through in that last hour and 10 minutes? This is and continues to be the holy grail of the state's case. That is, you can't possibly be uh, asserting self-defense if you thought about doing this in, a, in advance because it violates or goes against the traditional notions of self-defense. The point is, as Dr. Hanusa gave us the understanding to conclude from, that Donna was a captive to Gayan's abuse. After Gayan was arrested and left Hawaii, the cycle of abuse was in escalation phase. The tension was higher than she'd ever experienced, even with him. He was manic about being arrested, thrown in the can, and forced off the island. Gayan then announced he would kill her, Based on little else that Donna knew, he was so secretive, as you know, no discernible source of income, yet going all around the world. Based on her, connect- her knowledge of his connections to the mafia, his threats to have hitmen killed Donna or her brother, she reasonably believed that Gayan had the ability to carry out these threats at any moment. One call, one shot. Her helplessness, and that's a term you heard from Dr. Hanusa, stemmed from her previously failed efforts to quell his threats. Nothing worked. She tried to tell Gayan, go away, that she wanted nothing to do do with him. That didn't work. She tried to get Gayan to stop pursuing her by saying she was gay, by being as mean as she could. That didn't work. She called the police time and again, regardless of whether the police did something or not. That didn't work. The Maui police arrested him, kicked him off Maui. That didn't stop him from pursuing her. It didn't stop his threats. He began contacting her almost as soon as he got home. 
So the orde- the, in order to forestall these death threats to herself and her family, she pretended to make up with Michael Gahan and agreed to come to Kenosha as demanded. She believed, and she said this credibly, had she refused this request, it would have been one call, one shot. She believed that the only way to permanently terminate his threats of unlawful interference was to kill him. And she believed she could only succeed in killing him if she caught him off guard. So Donna's fear was real, that this could happen to her kid or her brother at any time. I used the hostage analogy when I started this argument. I want to amplify it just a little bit here. Someone is being held by a terrorist with a sword in his belt, and she is told she will be killed on day five. She manages somehow to kill him on day four. Is that premeditation? It sure is. Is it justified? It sure is. Just a quick note on armed burglary. Consent to, if she had consent to enter the house, you can look at the, which she did. It was open to her at all times. There were keys. You'll look at the instructions about that. She'd find her not guilty of that. So her fear was imminent. The threat was dreadfully visible, and it was horrifyingly invisible. That's important. So I want to talk to you now as I conclude about self-defense and the instructions that the judge has already given you. First of all, the word imminent appears in, there, in those instructions. You've heard the prosecutor give you her own construction of what that word means. You won't see a definition of imminent in all of those pages of instructions. You can use your own definition of it. And that definition needs to expand and be flexible based on the abused women's, woman's syndrome that Donna was laboring under. If something is inevitable, is it imminent? That's for you to decide. If something is impending, is it imminent? That's for you to decide, not for the prosecutor to tell you what imminent is. Imminent is in the mind and in the eye and in the heart of the abused, and that's Donna Matthews. So please bear that in mind. It's, a fu- it's an interesting word which we use in ordinary context. Sometimes you'll, see a, a, you'll hear a tornado warning, and you'll see the clouds darkening, and, you'd, and you are told that the um, storm is imminent, but you don't see anything happening, but you have this dread, and you know it, and then suddenly that, that funnel cloud comes down, and imminence has reared its ugly head, and maybe you waited until it was too late. So these instructions are very involved, as you heard when the judge read them. You're going to have to study them, and you will, and you'll understand them. But in essence, you'll see actually believed that fear or death or great bodily harm to herself or another was not only did she believe it, that it was imminent, but that that belief was reasonable. And if you, if you decide, <coughs> considering all the things that oh, I've talked about and the history of the case with this monster, this abuser, her breath-to-breath, day-to-day existence, suffering under his relentless assault, If you understand that, you should apply that to deciding whether or not Donna Matthews actually believed that this imminent fear, as described, was present and if that belief was reasonable. And you have to put yourself in the shoes of Donna Matthews. Put yourself in her shoes. It's crucially important. And another really important thing, which you'll see as you go through these instructions, that 
The burden of proof is always on the state beyond a reasonable doubt. And if, the, if you're deciding, yes, it looks, we, we accept that Donna Matthews actually believed this, and we accept that her belief was reasonable. The state has to disprove that beyond a reasonable doubt. The burden is on them to disprove beyond a reasonable doubt the elements, as I've discussed, in self-defense. It's very, very important, and I emphasize it now because, as I said, these instructions take some focus. They take some concentration. So, in that regard, the state has not met their burden. I tell you that right now. And I don't care how many times the prosecutor brings up what she perceives as lies, which are really uh, translation answers I don't like. No matter how many times she does that again, because she gets to talk to you again. I know it's getting late and it's hot, but that's the reality of it. The state gets, because they have such a heavy burden of proof, they get the last word. I don't like that, but that's the rule. Ask her, have you proven beyond a reasonable doubt? Have you disproven beyond a reasonable doubt what the defense said happened here? I don't think so. These facts establish that Donna Matthews should be acquitted of first-degree murder and second-degree murder. There's a very important instruction. They're all important. Prosecutor like will probably want to emphasize hers. I want to emphasize this one. I'll read it to you. Please listen to me. If you can reconcile the evidence upon any reasonable hypothesis of innocence, excuse me, any reasonable hypothesis consistent with the defendant's innocence, you should do that and return a verdict of not guilty. That's a very, very important instruction. That's fundamental to this case and all cases. Reasonable hypothesis of innocence. In this case, did Donna actually believe that this fear, this, that there was this imminent fear of great bodily harm and death? And was that belief reasonable? That constitutes a reasonable hypothesis of innocence. And you should accept it consistent with this instruction. There is, you're going to get several forms of verdict. And uh, those forms of verdict, you'll see what they say. But there is one form in particular that we would like you to focus on. It says, we the jury find the defendant not guilty of first degree intentional homicide charged to a crime as charged in count one. That's the not guilty verdict. That acquits Donna of first and second degree murder, the one that talks about finding her not guilty in count one. Folks, he controlled her. Her state of mind was at all times that he could kill her and her family at any moment. She had exhausted her options. She acted in the moment to save herself and her family from a deranged and manipulative monster. I turned back. 